if I could, I would be more present than afar. If I could, I would worship you in the stars. If I could, if I could. I would change the world with your grace If I could, I would feel your pain, your embrace If I could, I would see the beauty of your face Scripture reading comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy and almighty creator of heaven and earth, we come before you in this moment aware of the distance of the gap between us as your children and you in your holiness. We admit before you this morning that there is nothing that we can do until you will it so. And so we ask in all of your grace, in all of your mercy, in all of that boundless love with which you made all of creation, that you would be faithful unto us and to deliver to us your spirit that you would blow in this place so that we might know the power of your presence, that you would give us that power, peace, that joy, that stillness, that encouragement, and fill us with love. Oh God, we ask that you would open our eyes, ears, hearts, and our minds, that you would make fallow the ground of our souls so it might become good soil for the planting of your word and with time and tending bear good fruit for the kingdom of God. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Certainly you know the story that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. 
And the way the story is told in first Genesis, we start with this primordial situation of unbounded chaos over which the Spirit of God hovers. Now the word in Hebrew that's translated as the, uh, the formless void, in other places it's, um, it's translated as the deep, uh, this word is tohu vabohu. Tohu means wilderness or wasteland or chaos unbounded by anything. And vabohu is a way of saying that it's really, really chaotic. It's almost like a, uh, a literary construction, like an automatopoeia, where it's supposed to sound like what it is. And so God is hovering over this chaos. And the image that we're supposed to have in our mind is like a violent uh, water that's way out in the midst of the ocean and the waves are lapping over one another. This is the unbounded chaos that exists in the beginning of creation. And then we have God. It says the Spirit of God is hovering over this formless void. Now the word in Hebrew that is translated as spirit is ruach. And just as a side note, ruach is a feminine Hebrew noun. So the second mention of God in the entire Bible is that of a she, something that we should keep in mind anytime we allow the barriers and boundaries, the walls that we place around God to fit into some kind of conception that we try to grasp onto. We need to remember that God is literally beyond our comprehension and beyond our descriptions. So the Ruach of God hovers over the formless void. And Ruach is the spirit, but it's not this still spirit or this invisible force that occupies bodies. The spirit of God is a violent wind. And so the image really is kind of like a storm or like a hurricane that is churning over a violent sea way out in the midst of the ocean in the middle of the night. And what's important about that is that if there was a storm on top of the water, then it would be difficult if you were to get close to the surface to determine where the storm ended and where the water began, and that's intentional. God, after that, makes a distinction between the essence of God and all of the chaos by speaking a word. Because words, language, literally create worlds. When we give things name, we give them shape. And so God differentiates the divine self from the chaos over which it hovers. He says, let there be light. And there was light. The image that we have now is kind of like a mist or like a, a dusk or a dawn where light and darkness are all mixed together. And then it says that God separates the light from the darkness and pulls out the light and puts it into one place and pulls out the darkness and puts it in another place. And these are called day and night respectively. This is a continued ordering of creation. We start with chaos and God is slowly separating and bringing order to it. The next thing that happens is that God separates the waters from below, from the waters of above. In the ancient conception, the sky was actually a dome. This is the way that ancient people believed. And the dome had water on the other side of it. And that explained why rain would come down from the sky. It also explains to them why the sky is blue. And so God does further separation, the waters above from the waters below. And then God brings dry land out of the water, continuing this ordering of what used to be a chaotic mess that is formless and void everywhere. God creates sun, moon, and stars. God brings plants into the land and animals in the ocean and, and upon the land. And then in the penultimate moment of creation, God makes human beings in the divine image, male and female, and places them in the midst of all this creation. The climax comes immediately after that in the institution of the Sabbath. But in this moment, we see that God has done something miraculous to make something in God's image, to do God's work, to place it in God's creation with an instruction to be fruitful, to multiply, to subdue the earth, and to have dominion over it. Now, usually when I hear discussions about Genesis, nine times out of ten, I think, they usually devolve into a heated argument about whether or not we should understand Genesis this way as a literal blow-by-blow -blow of creation or it should be understood metaphorically or symbolically or what have you. 
And usually these conversations uh, center around how it is that we should understand these stories in the midst of what we know through scientific discovery about the origins of the world. Quite frankly, it's the most uninteresting question you can possibly imagine. Who cares? If you're absolutely convinced it's one way, terrific, so what? If you're absolutely convinced it's the other way, wonderful, I'm glad for you, so what? The point of reading these stories is to understand something, to dive deep into the truth about God and understand who God is and what the character of God is, who we are and what our relationship is to God. The point of reading scripture as a whole is to step inside of the text that has formed the worlds of millions of people that have come before us and to allow those words, that language, those texts, that scripture to shape our world so that when we go out into the world and we, we look around, we see that hope is always around the corner. We see that good news is everywhere and we see that the presence of God is imbued in every corner of creation. So, given that, the question is, so what? What is it that we're supposed to understand about God or ourselves or our relationship to God? Where is the good news? Where is the hope? Where is the presence of God in all creation in this particular story? Glad you asked. You all asked good questions. In order to understand that, we have to recognize that at the time that these stories were coming together and being written down by early Israelites, when they took all of these oral stories that were passed down generation after generation about the origin of the world and the institution of humanity in the midst of God's good creation, as people were writing this, there was another creation story that was circulating around the ancient world. That's called the Enuma Elish, and it's centered in the area of Babylon. In the Enuma Elish, if you're interested, just catch me after the worship service. I'll tell you how to spell it, look it up. It's pretty fascinating. But the Enuma Elish is a story about where we all come from. And the Enuma Elish says that in the beginning there were gods. And in this pantheon of gods, there was a war that broke out. And in the midst of this war, certain gods were defeated and destroyed uh, by other ones. And out of the corpses of the defeated gods, the victorious gods created everything that is, all of the earth and all of human beings, and placed human beings within it. This story says that we, what we really are, is something that is made out of the corpse of defeated divine beings. And the reason that we are created is to be slaves. Because as the Enuma Elish says, that the gods didn't want to have to do any work. And so they created human beings to be put into the earth to do all the work that they didn't want to do. That's why we are created. And you can understand how somebody who would read that and allow that story to shape their worldview would kind of make a little bit of sense. Because in the ancient world, like most of human history, for most of humanity, people have worked like crazy just to stay alive. Most of human existence outside of this small bubble of time that we live in right now was absolutely brutal. And everyone was just one bad crop or one disagreement with your neighbor away from destruction. And so it'd be easy to believe, yeah, I guess we are made for bondage. I guess we are made for slavery. I guess we are made for this endless labor day after day after day because that sure describes the life that we live. But that's not what Genesis says. Genesis has a different narrative. Genesis gives us a different picture. Genesis invites us to shape our understanding of the world in a completely different way. Genesis says that our God is good, that our God is very good, that our God is filled with love and compassion, mercy, and is faithful, meaning that when God makes a promise and God's, when God says something, that God fulfills that promise. And the essence of God's goodness is that God will take chaos, and chaos is what is always lurking at the door. Chaos is what is dangerous. Chaos is what is threatening to take your life threatening to spin your world into disorder, that our God is so good that the essence of God is one that takes that chaos and makes increasing order out of it. And that our place in all of this is that we are created and put inside of creation to continue the work of God. 
God brings order out of chaos. God puts us in the world to continue that ordering out of chaos. God says, be fruitful and multiply. Subdue and have dominion over the world. That is our job, to continue the creation that God has started. And that also would make a lot of sense because people would have been working so incredibly hard just to stay alive. But the difference between the Enuma Elish worldview and the Genesis worldview is that there is a purpose, that there is a hope, that there is good news in the labor that we perform. That day after day after day, we are bringing increasing order to that which is constantly threatened with disorder. That we cultivate, that we develop agriculture so that we might bring more order and order is good. That we would build cities, that we would build technologies, that we would develop the humanities, the sciences, the arts, medicine, so that we might bring increasing order in order in order to what otherwise would be disorder and chaos. And that, coincidentally, accounts for the fact that we live in this relative historic prosperity. That none of us are going to go home today and have to worry about how it is that we can literally stay alive until tomorrow. Because all of our ancestors for generation after generation have been working to continue to do God's work in bringing order out of chaos. And that is a good word for the church today. That is a good way for us to understand what it is that we are called to do because we live in a world where chaos still abounds. And we have to remember that our job as Christians, that to be a church is, is not just to show up for one hour on a Sunday morning in a particular parcel of real estate, gather into a comfortable air-conditioned room and to sing songs, to stand up, to sit down, to listen to a sermon, to shake hands with one another and then go back out into the world in which we came. Worship is extremely important, one of the most important things that we do, but it's not, the most, it's not the only thing that we do, and it's not even a majority of what we do. We're meant to come into this space together, not to be entertained, not to, to, uh, to listen to somebody else tell us what to do. We're not here just to be in the presence of one another, to escape the world. We are meant to come and to worship that good God. We are meant to come into the presence of one another and understand that our God is so good that God is constantly working in our lives to bring the things that threaten chaos into increasing order and into increasing fruitfulness. That we come together when we worship and we bring our spirits together and like a mighty ruach hurricane go out over the chaos and bring order to it. We go out into the world where we find the chaos of division and we bring order to it. That's our job. There's chaos everywhere and, and you'll see it this holiday season. When at Thanksgiving, siblings won't be able to sit at the table with one another because she voted for him and she voted for her. That's chaos. We live in a community where we are still divided in 2018 because of the pigmentation of our skin color. How ridiculous is that? Every place in the world is more integrated. Every place in the world is more diverse than the church on Sunday morning at 11 a.m. That is unconscionable and it is chaos and we are meant to go and to roll up our sleeves and to get knee deep in all of the muck and mire to do the hard labor to bring people together. It's chaos when I find out that neighbors can't live next to one another because of their history or because of their socioeconomic status. You know, we are in the midst of an opioid crisis right now. Some of you know this all too well because you have felt the sting of what that means deep within your heart. It is killing people and ripping families apart. And if there is going to be a solution to this epidemic that we're in right now, let me tell you what you have to have, non-negotiable. You have to have places where people can live and get sober in a safe environment that is going to be supportive of sobriety. Halfway houses, you might call them. Yet it was just a couple of weeks ago that Danville decided that we don't want one of those in our neighborhood. Put it somewhere else. And I found out that that's not the first time that's happened in our community, that we've decided that people coming out of prison or people that have a past or people that are trying to get sober, you know, God bless them, more luck to them, but don't bring that around us. That's chaos because what happens is they're in your neighborhoods anyway. They're just not getting support or not getting sober. 
So we have to have a strategy. We have to have the compassion and love of God that seeks to do the hard labor of helping eliminate the chaos in our community. There are people who are suffering from the chaos in this day and age when we have so much food and so much plenty of poverty. And we as the church are called to do the hard labor of acquiring food, of collecting food, of bringing the food, of delivering the food, and feeding those who are hungry. Those who are homeless need homes. And it's these hands, it's these arms that are supposed to go out and swing hammers so that we can erect places for people to live. There are those who are hurting. Those are those who are broken. There are those who have been wounded. There are those who have been traumatized by violence against their bodies. And they deserve healing. They deserve to be made unbroken. They deserve the love of God to pour into their wounds and to make them whole. It's their birthright by virtue of being a good creation of God made in the divine image. And that's our job, to roll up our sleeves, to get to work, to do it to perform God's work, that difficult labor. And I think that this church, and this is why I'm so blessed to be here and serve as pastor, I believe that this church is perfectly positioned to do that kind of work and to have success and to be faithful to that call. I know it because I talk to a lot of you. I know it because I talk to people who come and visit with us. I talk to outsiders who look at us, and they can see that we have a heart for service, that we are not afraid to work, that we are willing to roll up our sleeves and get our hands dirty and to get knee-deep in the muck and mire of the chaos of this world, and that we won't quit until the work is done. Now, up until about halfway through last week, I thought about that, and that was going to be what I said, And then we'd all celebrate the goodness of Jesus, go home and come back next Sunday. But then I realized that that's only one reason I believe we'll be successful. It's attractive to me to only focus on that, which is why I'm so grateful that God opened my eyes and showed me something else that I did not see. That that work in and of itself does not eliminate chaos. In fact, sometimes work just for work's sake or work for the wrong reason brings a fair amount of chaos into your life. And I know that some of you know exactly what I'm talking about because you are almost literally working yourselves to death, ripping yourself away from your families. That's that's not order. That's not good. That's not God's intention. It's not just work for work's sake. It's work with something else. And I want to talk about that something else. It's when I go to somebody's house who has lost their mobility and they can't get out and come to church on Sunday morning. In fact, they really can't even get out the house at all except for the occasional doctor's appointment and even within, even then they need help from other people to do so. And I go and I sit with them from time to time, our homebound saints of this church, and we talk and before I leave, they say to me, you know, I pray every day for you and the new associate Griffin and for this church. And when they say that, I feel something come into my body and I know that it's true. And I recognize that that is the breath of God reaching through the prayers of someone else that blesses the work that we do. It's not that you have this thing that people do and this thing that people do and you can have a little bit of that or a little bit of that or all of this or all of that. No, no, you have to have both together. It's this thing that happens when I'm sitting in my office in the middle of the week And an elder of the church comes in and sits across from me to complain about something. And a lesser minister would get offended or take it personally or write them off as a grumpy old man or woman. But the uh, the eyes that God has given me helps me to recognize that no, 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 no. This is a person who has spent decades in the church and spends all night tossing and turning, thinking about this church and what this church can do to improve itself and to be more effective. And they come and they bring that to me and God reaches through that complaint and criticism and blesses the work that we do. It's what happens when I'm out in the narthex and there's a little girl, four years old. She doesn't have a job. She doesn't have a checkbook. She can't write a check or give money or go feed homeless or build houses. But she comes and she embraces me with a great big hug. And I feel just a little bit more encouraged. And God blesses the work that we do through that embrace. It's the little boy who races down from the balcony to come and see me first thing when I go out into that narthex to ask me a question about a sermon, something that I said six weeks ago and God reaches through that care and concern 
that young person who takes this work seriously and blesses the rest of the work that we do. It's the lady that is with a cane and she stands here and, and moves very slowly down the aisle for 10, sometimes 15 minutes. And she's got no business doing that. She needs to get out of here. Go sit down. Take a load off. Get that knee up so it won't swell. And she stands and she walks slowly down that aisle so she can come and bless me with all the good news that's happening in her life. It's the people that put flowers on my desk and bring soup to those of you when you're sick. It's the people that pray day in and day out for the healing to come in your lives. It's the people that write me letters and they say you have no idea how much this church has changed my life and there's really not a whole lot that I can do and I really don't have any way that I can repay but I just have to let you know that I am overflowing with gratitude and God reaches through that gratitude and blesses the work that we do. It's as though we are a well-tuned, uh, oiled machine ready to go out and tear up the world but if we don't have any fuel in the tank we can't do nothing. And it's the prayers, it's the love, it's the time that people spend thinking about and blessing this church that puts the gas in the tank and makes this thing go. And that's important because I know there's a lot of people out there that aren't like me. Meaning that I, I'm young, I'm energetic, I'm strong, I'm healthy, I like to do work and I like to go out and work hard because it makes me feel good. And there's plenty of people who are past their prime and don't have the voice that I do, or maybe they don't have the same abilities as everyone else, and they think that, well, I guess that means there's nothing for me to do in the church. And I just want to say to you, oh my gosh, you could not be more wrong. There is nothing that I can do with all of my phys physical abilities, that, uh, there's nothing that I can do with all my physical abilities without the prayers and your spiritual abilities. I need that love. I need that encouragement. I need that inspiration. Do you know how hard it is to go out and to try to make a difference in, in racism that has persisted in this country for centuries? Do you know how hard it is to feed those who are in chronic poverty? Do you know how hard it is to tackle the division that is in this world that is fueled by a media system that is just hell-bent on destroying this nation? Do you know how hard it is to do that kind of work? It'd be easy for me to give up by 5 o'clock today. But because of your prayers, because of your encouragement, because of your inspiration, because of your love, because of your phone calls, because of your letters, because of the flowers you put on my desk, that card that says, keep pressing on because I know that the work that you do is blessed by God. We can work one more day and God blesses all of our work. It's love. It's love. That's what it is. We look at the work that God does and we step right over the fact that it was the love that motivated him to do it. It was the love that called everything into creation and made chaos into cosmos. It was love that chased all of us to the ends of the earth. The times that we have disobeyed God and the people of Israel went back out into the wilderness again and again and again. It was love to look down upon the cries of God's people, heard those cries and decided this is something I want to get personally involved in and step down from 40 and two generations to put on human flesh and walk among us. It was love that held Jesus to the cross, though we crucified him. It was love that rose Jesus from the grave, that called him out of that tomb, that called the church into being, that poured on the people down in Pentecost. It was love. It was love that did it. It's the love that's going to do it here. And it's the love that we need from all of you. That is what God's work is. That is, that is doing the Lord's work. That is bringing the chaos and putting it into creation, taking that chaos and, and forming it into, into order. But I just have to say thank you to all of you who pray, to all of you who bless me, to all of you who encourage and inspire me, to all of those who do the same things for everyone else in this church, for all of you who pull somebody inside and say, I wish I could be out there doing that hard labor that you do, but I, I can't anymore, so I'm going to say a prayer for you. We need those prayers, and thank you. Thank you for doing God's work. Amen. Jesus steps out of the tradition of his Israelite ancestors that came before him. But instead, looking backwards to the Garden of Eden, the grace from which we fell, he looks forward to the kingdom of God, which we are called to build. That we are called to continue this ordering out of chaos. That we are to continue our relentless pursuit of correcting the injustices of this world to advocating for those who are voiceless, to taking our hands and our feet, to put ourselves on the line to deliver the daily bread for which people pray, to be the hands of love, to be the feet of love, to be the voice of love. 
The night that Jesus gathered with his disciples around the table, he spoke words to them they did not understand, but we would come to cherish and repeat in all of the years since. He said to them, after taking a loaf of bread, blessing and breaking it, that this was his body. Take and eat and do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. And as you remain on your feet, we move into our invitation to discipleship. This is the time in which we look forward to the week ahead and think of the ways that we can take what has been received by the, from the Spirit of God, communicated through sermon and through song, through the fellowship with one another, and the ways that we can take that out into the world to spread the good news, the light, and the hope of Jesus Christ to those who are lost and lonely, those who are hungry, hurting, and homeless, those who are in need of the love that we offer. This is also the time that we set aside for anyone who would like to join First Christian Church. If you are looking for a church home, and if you don't have one, you do need one, uh, we would love to accept you into this amazing family of faith. Uh, we will extend that invitation in just a moment when we begin our hymn of discipleship. Before I do that, I, I would be remiss if I didn't just say thank you to everyone uh, while I was gone who helped make the worship service happen. I heard we had a wonderful worship service, so I thank uh, Griffin for taking over in my absence. I thank uh, Reverend Blond uh, David Blondell who came and preached uh, for everyone who was here and made a joyful noise unto the Lord. Uh, also, just to let you know, we're going to have our tracker treat. That is our variation of the trunk or treat. We move it from a parking lot onto our walking track. We did it last year. It was awesome. Uh, we're going to do it again this year. And we had 400 people last year show up, and so uh, we think it's going to be even bigger this year. So be looking forward to that at the end of October. This is the moment that you are invited to come forward if you are looking to confess uh, your faith in Christ or to transfer membership or to join this church. And you can do that as we sing our hymn of discipleship. What a glorious day it is to be in the house of the Lord as we have had one brother come forth and wants to make his intention known to join this family of faith. I hope that you know already Bill Owens. He is a wonderful, wonderful... We can, yeah, we can applaud. So not only this morning did, um, uh, did uh, Bill bring his gifts in singing to us uh, in, in praise of God, but also Bill wrote that song. He is a, uh, a songsmith of, of, of every color and flavor. He's multi-talented in many, many different ways. But he has come forward this morning uh, to uh, express his interest in joining this church and to make that intention known. As you know, Bill, Bill is a, a disciple in his heart, so he knows how we do things here. And he's a Timothy from this church. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome home, brother. <laughs> So we have no creeds, we have no official doctrines, we have no tests of faith in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. And so we just have one question, and the question is, do you accept that Jesus is the Son of God, our Lord and Savior? Absolutely. Wonderful. Well, then I am so privileged to be the first to say to you this morning, welcome home. benediction of God. Gracious and holy God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the blessings expected and unexpected. We thank you that you have not disappointed, that you have been faithful in the giving of your spirit. We thank you for every voice in this church that lifts up praises to you and every voice that mutters prayers for all of us, which blesses our work. We thank you especially for our brother Bill, who has come forward to become a part of this family of faith in an essential way, and we ask that you would bless him in all the work that he does. We ask you now, O oh God, in your spirit, to send us out into the world with love and with hope and with peace to love and to serve you. Amen. Amen. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. shall be given unto you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be 